Good morning to everybody. And I must say I am quite happy to appear in this context to say a few words more technical, I should say, about the European, the functioning of the European Court of Human Rights. Um, legally speaking, the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights are binding on the states, we, uh, states which are parties to the particular dispute. The convention is explicit in saying that the judgments are directly binding on the uh, state and the party concerned, um, but it does not say that the judgment is binding erga omnes. In constitutional law, we distinguish between the erga omnes effect, uh, which is against everybody, where the judgments become a source of law, rechtsquelle in German, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the inter partes uh, effect of the judgment, which is what the convention actually says. So in other words, when we are talking about universality of human rights, in principle, and at the beginning of the functioning of the European Court of Human Rights, the judgments were not a source of law. They did, however, become a source of law uh, as time went on, because it was obvious that the de facto binding nature of the judgments is part of the story that is happening in Strasbourg. In other words, if a similar case arose in a different context, with a different parties involved, with a different state if, if involved in the dispute, the judgment in the previous case would be binding. In other words, we are talking about something which is very familiar to the common lawyers, uh, which is the stare decisis, or, uh, or the idea that the like cases should be decided alike. Again, I emphasize the convention doesn't foresee that the judgments of the European Court would be the source of, source of law, but de facto this is happening because the, everybody knows that a new case coming from whatever country, from, from Spain to, to Russia, from Norway to Cyprus, uh, will be adjudicated, will be perceived, will be uh, decided according to the old precedent. In other words, if you open any case uh, rendered by the section of seven judge and judges or the grand chamber of 17 judges, uh, you, will, you will find today citations of many cases previously decided by this court. Um, and that is part of the general story which at least in the context of this 800 million people from Vladivostok to Reykjavik, from North Cap to Limassol in Cyprus, are ma is making the human rights universal. This is based on the individual petition of an individual member of the states, and it's parallel to what uh, we call in constitutional law a certiorari or amparo or verfassungsbeschwerde or or whatever, which is the right of the individual to raise the issue in front of the constitutional court of his country, and likewise in front of the European Court of Human Rights. In fact, the European Court of Human Rights is in many cases today already the only instance which is above the constitutional courts of the particular country, whether that be Russia, Slovenia, uh, but of course, I must say that many countries do not have, do not have uh, uh, constitutional courts. And some of those who have constitutional courts, like the French Conseil d'État, uh, Conseil Constitutionnel, they don't have an individual petition that would make the court competent, give it jurisdiction over the particular case. Uh, so we have a body of precedents growing in many areas. Uh, all the constitutional courts that have individual petition, on the one hand, produce their own precedents, 
And then the question is to what extent are these judgments uh, in accordance with the, with the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. Therefore, you have a complex me mechanism which provides for an ongoing process, uh, due process of law, we could say, or law in action in all, the, in all the countries. Again, I emphasize, some countries do not have uh, constitutional courts, or if they have constitutional courts, they do not have an individual application to the constitutional court. As I said, Amparo, Verfassungsbeschwerde, certiorari in the United States, etc. Uh, but those that do, they, in fact, are better protected, so to say, vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the Strasbourg court. Because if you have a constitutional court like Turkey introduced one about 10 years ago, then the issues might be decided at home. They need not be decided uh, in, in Strasbourg, which is cheaper. And of course, it, the state is not then stigmatized by the uh, condemnation it might receive in one of the sections or in the Grand Chamber in, in Strasbourg. Now, um, excuse me, I'll just take my, my oh, 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 I thought, okay. Uh, the more interesting question, which has developed since I came to the court in 1998, I'm now the most senior judge in the court except for for one colleague. The, mo the interesting thing that has happened um, in the meanwhile is the follow as follows. When I came to the court in 1998, the violations of procedural rights, especially in criminal law, um, were decided according to an incantation formula, if I can say so, <laughs> uh, which said that the court will not speculate about the outcome of the case. In other words, you had a case in Italy, for example, somebody sitting in prison of Brindisi, uh, I'm referring to a particular case, um, and he was denied the right to cross-examine his witnesses in the trial against him in Italy. At that time, the court would say, oh, well, there has been a violation of your procedural rights. Your, the due process has been violated. This is not compatible with Article 6 of the Convention. But we, we, there's nothing we can do. So we'll give you 1,000 euros of damages. This is exactly what happened. And we'll, because you must have suffered a little because you weren't able to, to, uh, to cross-examine the witnesses against you. And that's the end of the story because we will not speculate about the outcome of the case. In other words, the court was saying, the court here in Strasbourg was saying, we don't know what would have happened did you have had the right to cross-examine the witnesses against you in that trial in Brindisi in Italy. Then came a case called Scottari v. Giunta v. v. Uh, Italy, um, which was the first case uh, in which the court said that restitutio in integrum was in its own power to pronounce, and I will explain immediately what that means. Um, in previous, according to Article 41, the court can sanction a violation of a particular state by giving money. But from that time on, from the case of Scotsari and Junta, on, the court suddenly had the right to require the state to reinstate the previous unlawful or, uh, yes, unlawful situation in terms of human rights. In Scotland and Junta, mother and grandmother were deprived of their children who were put in a fortetto, uh, foyer, home, in, next to Florence in Italy. Uh, but the court has decided not only that they are entitled to damages according to Article 41, but they are entitled to have the children back from that fortetto. And Italy, uh, Italy decided to 
obey that judgment of the court, which was probably the most revolutionary new precedent uh, in, in that time, uh, to give the, the, the children back, and some very important other cases, uh, uh, Bronyovsky, for example, have followed uh, from, from that. Um, and therefore, from that time on, in many cases, the court will require, Asanidze v. Georgia, for example, require the state to simply re reinstate the lawful situation which, has, which it has breached according to the judgment rendered by the court. Now, this is part of the story. The other part of the story is as follows. Uh, many states have, since 1998, the, which is the starting date of the so-called new court, uh, installed mechanisms at home whereby uh, a procedural violation, mostly in criminal law but also in, in civil law matters, uh, is required to be reprocessed by the state. Switzerland was the first to uh, uh, engage in this kind of obligation, unilateral obligation vis-a-vis -vis the court. And the Swiss case, Tierfabriken Schweiz versus Switzerland is the most important case in this respect. Uh, what does that mean? It means that, that the states, rather than the convention on the court, have them unilaterally, spontaneously obliged themselves to, uh, to uh, reprocess, reopen the proceedings in a particular situation because the court has found a violation of human rights. Uh, Switzerland has, is the model for this, has uh, the, the requirement in civil law, in criminal law, and in, 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 in administrative law. Some other states, like Slovenia, for example, have limited themselves to, the, to reprocessing of the, of the uh, criminal cases. Uh, but the interesting thing is what happens once this law in a particular country, whichever, is put into action. In other words, the, the court in Strasbourg will find a violation. The law, the internal law of the country, let's say Poland, requires, gives the right to the applicant to request a reopening of the trial against him. And the state must then take into account, that's why I talk about the binding nature of the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, must take into account the judgment of the court, not only in its operative part, but also in, its, in the spirit. We, the Europeans, are used to the continental uh, interpretation of the, of the judgment in which the operative part, the so-called dispositive, is binding, and the rest of the judgment is merely a, uh, an explanation, a motivation of the judgment. However, here, when the ping pong started between the state and the court, in the case of Schweiz, uh, of uh, Tierfabriken versus, uh, versus, versus uh, Switzerland, or in a case called Steck Rich, Rich v. Liechtenstein in 2010, in those two cases, and there some of them are in the pipeline, in those two cases, the state concerned, that is Switzerland and Liechtenstein, has in fact reopened the proceedings, but the applicant was not happy with that kind of uh, reprocessing of the situation and came back to Strasbourg. In other words, he said, there has been another violation on the part of my country because they have uh, reopened the proceedings, but they didn't f follow the spirit of the, of, the, of the judgment so rendered. Um, what does this have to do with universality of human rights? Obviously, there's many, there are many inspiring um, writings about the universality of human rights, but here we are talking something very specific. Um, if the judgment of the court 
is binding, de facto binding on every state in the, in the, in the European uh, continent, then the violation of that uh, right, insofar as it ever comes to Strasbourg to be decided, is something that is bound by precedent. Again, we the, in Europe did not have an inkling about the power of precedence, except perhaps in the French administrative law, before this has happened. The, the constitutional courts, in particular countries, are now bound by their own precedents, and people are bound by their own precedents. Uh, but that can go there maybe on three or four different levels. You can have a de facto binding effect because everybody knows that a new case is going to be decided the way the old case was. Therefore, like cases should be decided the like. It can be a formally binding, like in Germany, uh, constitutional court judgments might be formally binding on everybody. And then on top of that, you can have a situation where the judgment is binding, is binding as a source of law which is exactly what you have in the United States. In the United States, the Supreme Court's judgments are uh, binding on everybody. And then, of course, you have a pyramid. On the top, you have a Supreme Court. Then you have circuit courts, nine circuits or more. And then down on the bottom <coughs> of that pyramid, excuse me, you have, you have all the district courts. And so if somebody in the system notices that a particular decision by a district court judge in Brooklyn, New York, is not in accordance with, with the Supreme Court's uh, precedent, he can raise the issue and win on appeal, if not before that. Um, but the situation here is one of a pyramid. You, as I said, you have a Supreme Court, and then the messages from the Supreme Court are trickling down to the bottom of the pyramid, where, whereby the system is becoming sort of universal because it follows the, the path dictated by the Supreme Court. Now, Euro the European Court of Human Rights is in a different position. This is the tip of the pyramid, uh, but underneath that tip of the pyramid, you have 47 different countries. Uh, in other words, when uh, the European Court of Human Rights will render a judgment uh, saying that, for example, as I said before, that in a, in a situation where somebody is uh, deprived of his right to cross-examine the witnesses, if, if that judgment is pronounced vis-a-vis -vis Italy, it is de facto binding on everybody, but the way this is going to be interpreted in Russia or in Azerbaijan or in Iceland may be very different. In other words, you have one tip of the pyramid, and immediately beneath that, you have 47 different pyramids. And the universality of human rights, and I will conclude with that, the universality of human rights in that sense depends um, on the concordance of reaction in different countries. And of course, is, there is no way to control that. The reaction in Azerbaijan may be completely different of the reaction, for example, in the United Kingdom. Oh, by the way, I should say that, of course, Despite the English skepticism vis-a-vis -vis the court, this is probably, the court itself is probably a major uh, inlay of the uh, British culture in the, on the continent that did not know before the power of the precedents, the power of stare decisis, and the power of the, of, the, of the principle that like cases should be decided alike. In other words, the universality of human rights in this space of 800,000 people, 800, 800 million people, it depends entirely on the, on the way the lower state domestic jurisdictions will communicate with the tip of the pyramid above them. Thank you very much.